Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to be giving a brief overview of the Sodalite project and, and what exactly it is. Um, so it is a uh, software technologies project that was uh, funded under Horizon 2020. And uh, really the main focus is how do we deal with um, software-defined application and infrastructure uh, management and, uh, and, and definition. Uh, so we'll I'll now start with our, our, our basis. Um, so what is, is really the problem that Sodalite is trying to solve? Uh, well, at the moment, everything is, is really software-defined. We're really in a software-defined world. Um, we have really different kinds of layers that are, that are involved in this. And cloud has become increasingly ubiquitous. It uh, makes up most of the uh, back-end aspects in, in our daily lives. Um, HPC continues to be very prominent in, in industrial design, computer-aided engineering. Uh, simulations and things of this nature. Um, but one of the things it really suffers from is that it's not more widely accessible. Um, so outside of research centers and, and supercomputing centers, it can be quite difficult uh, for people to make more transparent and, and ready use of these uh, high performance resources. And the, the third uh, layer is really the introduction of the edge, uh, which is now really more fundamentally changing the cloud dynamic um, this is both through a combination of things like latency and security requirements, uh, as well as privacy requirements, um, but also carries with it a lot of um, interesting challenges in terms of computational limitations, uh, deployment artifacts and, and challenges and things of this nature. So as an application developer, um, it's really difficult to really make use of all of these in a, in a transparent way. Uh, not to mention you don't necessarily want to have to codify every single possible configuration from the infrastructure side within your application, um, as this, of course, may be subject to change. Um, so where does Sodalite come in? Well, the main solution that Sodalite provides is it's basically a set of tools to enable the simpler and faster deployment uh, and modeling and, and execution of these applications um, across heterogeneous resources. Uh, so this is um, really looking at all of these different aspects of so deployment across HPC, uh, cloud, as well as edge, and uh, different software-defined computing environments. Um, so how does this uh, solution look in practice? Well, the main parts is that we have really two actors that are involved in the system. One is uh, the infrastructure modeling, and the other side is the application modeling. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have two different uh, key actors. One is really the infrastructure operator and owner that really has the insights into the underlying infrastructure and can provide uh, modeling for that particular infrastructure. Um, the other side is the application developer, who of course has a, a more profound understanding of the application and business logic that has to go into their, uh, into their application. Um, so one of the key things that um, Sodalite provides is an IDE uh, where an application developer can go in and begin to codify some of these requirements uh, from the application side. Uh, from that, they can then also drive uh, these different infrastructure models um, that are available as well. Um, and in the end, we end up with the integrated uh, model that contains both aspects of the application requirements as well as the infrastructure deployment patterns. Uh, and this, the key part of this is that the patterns for the infrastructure deployment are something that are uh, fairly independent of the underlying model, which means that it's something that can be adapted and deployed onto various types of infrastructure uh, during the runtime of the application. Uh, the next layer is the runtime parameter framework. Uh, so this is really looking at a lot of the uh, runtime optimizations and, and other things that can be done uh, to the system. Uh, within the IDE itself, uh, there's a, some assistance in terms of the definition of the application logic, um, in terms of the uh, semantic ontologies and, and things of this nature, which makes it easier for application developers to uh, move forward to find the things that they need. There's also a native optimization library, uh, which provides a number of static optimization points that can be applied for the different kinds of resources uh, that may be available. Um, however, the real value of Sodalite is that a lot of these are not just statically defined within the application definition, um, but are also rolled out um, during the runtime. So if we look at Sodalite as a solution, uh, so the key thing is, well, a lot of this could theoretically be dealt with with traditional infrastructure as code modeling. And that's true. However, that really only covers the infrastructure aspects. The thing that's uh, fundamentally missing in traditional uh, infrastructure as code is that we do not have 
a co combination of this definition together with the application requirements. Uh, so a key challenge is that when these things are deployed, of course, we really need to understand not just the infrastructure state, but also the application needs, the environment, uh, and these things need to be assessed contextually in determining what sort of deployment um, is really possible. Um, in terms of uh, the repeatability and versioning, uh, this is also important, both in terms of auditability and regression testing and other aspects. So the combined models of the infrastructure and application side are, are versioned and stored, and these can be deployed directly into CI and CD pipelines for, for uh, continuous testing. Um, beyond that, we have assistance for the IDE for the developer as in terms of having uh, different patterns and different kinds of uh, semantic systems in terms of the definition. This makes it easier for them to get the help that they need in defining uh, the overall models. And uh, then the key aspects of the runtime are really in the automated optimization. Uh, so this includes a runtime monitor um, that looks at the infrastructure state and based on the changes that are occurring, it can uh, automatically trigger redeployment. Um, beyond that, a uh, big part of the way how the optimizations are managed are through a set of uh, different containers that can be deployed for the same, uh, for the same service uh, into different uh, heterogeneous infrastructures. Um, so in this case, we can have um, different optimized versions uh, that are available and we can make a, a runtime decision about which one to, to pivot to based on the, the, the changing of availability of the system and the resources. So what are the key benefits um, of this approach? Well, the, the key thing is that it gives us really uh, a lot of flexibility and openness in terms of the types of infrastructure that we use, where we deploy, um, increased simplicity for the application developer, not needing really to really understand the underlying details of what uh, infrastructure is available. Uh, the key thing is they want to make sure that their application requirements are met. Um, how exactly that is, is done is, is less uh, of a concern. Um, similarly, we can avoid vendor lock-in. Uh, we have three use cases within the project, and each of these use uh, quite a different application stack and completely different uh, deployment patterns. Uh, so, and then besides that also, uh, many of these are performance centric. So there are cases where we really have to be on an HPC system. There are kinds of cases where we really have to be on an edge system, um, simply from a latency point of view, um, as well as cost reduction. So if we can do something in, in uh, one tenth of the time on an HPC system compared to running on a similar cloud system, uh, of course, this can, can translate into real savings as well. Uh, so to go a little bit into the use cases, uh, the first use case that we have is uh, the water scarcity use case. Um, so this is a, uh, a very interesting use case. Uh, the challenge is, of course, that um, water as a resource is, is finite, and it's something that's becoming increasingly contended. Um, and the challenge here is that, well, there's a lot of mountains that have a lot of snow, and they provide uh, the vast majority of the fresh water for, for the planet. So how can we basically keep an eye on the snow and the melt uh, on these mountains over time uh, based on publicly available imagery? Um, so what this use case does is it basically looks at publicly available images of, of mountains and analyzes it uh, for the snow content. And from this, it tries to develop a, uh, a predictor in terms of the amount of water availability. Uh, so the interesting part of this use case is that it's not um, just a pure GPU problem that has a fairly complex data processing pipeline that at various times can be CPU bound, GPU bound, or IO bound. Um, and beyond that, um, they do not necessarily know what kind of infrastructure it's going to be running on or deployed in. Uh, so these are the sorts of things that need to be abstracted away and dealt with by the system. Um, so how does Sodalite um, solve this problem? Uh, well, the main value that uh, the Sodalite can bring is that it's already possible now to increase the number of images that can be processed. Um, so this also can improve the accuracy of, for the prediction. And this is mostly achieved by the uh, runtime reconfiguration and the application of optimizations as um, the processing goes through the pipeline in the different stages. Um, besides that, it also continues to provide the requisite requirement uh, for the deployment flexibility, uh, which is also central to this use case. In the second use case, we have uh, the vehicle IoT use case. Um, this is another challenge that focuses more on the cloud and edge dynamic. In this case, we have uh, an edge, uh, which is, happens to be the vehicle, um, and we have uh, the cloud, 
which is the basis for most of the services that are deployed into the vehicle. Uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, this carries a lot of risk um, in terms of the types of services that can be modeled and uh, deployed. Uh, when we look at safety critical or vehicle essential services, these are things that uh, typically need to be run within the vehicle itself. Um, and this is in contrast to things like infotainment services, which could be uh, delivered purely from the cloud. Uh, so this sort of decoupling and determining of uh, what to run where is something that's becoming much more important in, uh, in connected vehicles as, as we go forward. Um, so the key challenge for this use case also is not is because it isn't a vehicle, the, the cars of course move. Uh, so this means that the cars drive uh, across country borders and so on, which means that uh, provision services that are available in the vehicle also have to deal with the changing uh, requirements for privacy, for security, uh, as well as compliance of the national, uh, of the national legislation. Uh, depending on where the vehicle happens to be at any given time. Uh, so this also creates a lot of challenges for the, uh, for the application developer. Um, but the other aspect then is, well, given the limitations of computation that we have within the vehicle, um, how can we make sure that we use that for things that are really essential for the vehicle uh, in order in terms of keeping drivers safe? Um, and how do we make more effective use then of the cloud and HPC resources that are available in order to continue to provide value added services? Uh, so the key technical need that this use case has is that we have to deal with um, adaptive or self-adaptive uh, reconfiguration, both of the application uh, as well as the, of the deployment model. Uh, and this means also that within different vehicles, we will have uh, different compute resources. We may have different um, heterogeneous accelerators at the edge, uh, things of this nature, which must be dealt with independently from the cloud side. And, uh, and more importantly, especially if we look into things like fleet management and, and other applications, we have not just a pure cloud to edge um, scenario, but also cloud to cloud and, uh, and other environments that have to be considered. Uh, so the main value that Sodlight provides here um, is that it really provides us with a, a way to have um, optimized versions of services that can target these different heterogeneous resources. Um, and that this monitoring uh, of the environment is something that can be done constantly and that can trigger the reconfiguration at any time. Uh, and this is then quite essential in terms of meeting the QoS targets um, as well as the compliance needs of, of the use case. The third use case we have is in silico clinical trials. Um, so this is an interesting use case. Um, so this looks really at uh, uh, bone implants uh, for dealing with different spinal conditions. Um, the challenge that uh, this use case faces is that uh, really it's, it's difficult to make a general, uh, uh, a general definition of what a good implant would be for somebody. It really needs to be done on an individual basis. Um, right now, this is something that is done purely based on, on experience of, of, of the physicians and other people involved. Uh, but of course, this is a, a very uh, limiting factor. Uh, the other problem is, of course, to run clinical trials. It costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time, um, and uh, the utility of these are further uh, still up for, for question because of the uh, need for contextualization and individualization for the individual. Um, so really, in this case, uh, the, the challenge is, you know, how do we use HPC and cloud resources to make uh, simulated clinical trials uh, for the individual? Um, this is something that already has a production-ready and very complex workflow. Uh, the key challenge here is really looking at uh, performance requirements and looking at efficiency. So the, the cost and the performance trade-off is something that is very uh, important in, in this particular use case. Um, so the way that Sublight assists with this is that it deals with uh, both the static and runtime optimizations. Um, it simplifies the configuration, the deployment um, across the infrastructure. Um, and it also helps in, in terms of when new infrastructure comes out, uh, this is something that can be easily adapted and integrated uh, and can further uh, support the simulation. Okay. Um, and then we have a couple of, uh, of uh, nice quotes from our external advisory board members. Um, so this is uh, really clarifying or, or supporting what we said in terms of the fact that uh, self-adaptive systems are, are something that are, are, are very important and Sotlight can play a very important role um, in terms of how do we go from one end of the compute continuum to the other. Um, and this is something that gives us a, a, a real advantage in terms of the next generation of applications um, that need to be 
uh, able to be run in different kinds of environments without being uh, too tied or aware of the underlying infrastructure in which they're deployed. So the consortium of the project overall is, uh, is fairly well distributed. Um, we see Cray two times because, of course, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Brexit situation and the merger into, into HPE. Um, and we are coordinated by XLab. Um, and yes, I think that's, that's fine. Um, so I will leave it at that. Um, the key thing is, of course, for this project, uh, feel free to contact any of us at any time. Um, feel free to contact myself for any exploitation or innovation questions. Um, the other contacts are, of course, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, the other thing is, if you're interested in getting up and running with any of the things that we've developed so far, um, please look for us on, on GitHub. Um, everything that's being developed within the project is open source, um, so it will be there for people to experiment with. Um, we are still a little early in the project, um, so things are not quite in, in a state yet where they can be easily uh, deployed and experimented with uh, directly. Um, but we're hoping to, uh, to clean this up and get a version uh, put together that people can, can use uh, for getting up and running uh, quite soon. Um, so please keep an eye on that and, and let us know if there's anything else that you have uh, an interest in. Um, besides that, I would also like to mention that uh, we have prepared a online booth for the upcoming ISC HPC conference, uh, and you can find more information about this on our website. Uh, so now I'll turn it over for general questions. Thank you, Paul. So yes, now it's time to questions round. So if someone wants to start by asking questions to Paul, Please feel free. Okay, so maybe I can start. Um, uh, Paul, thank you very much for, for the very good uh, presentation. Uh, I'm Juan Costa from MaxLab. Uh, I'd like to ask you, um, what uh, do you think, in your opinion, uh, is, the, is the impact uh, of these results uh, and how they, they will um, can, can scale out in, in the industrial scenario? Well, I think one of the, the, the key advantages is really the, how we do the infrastructure as, as code definition and the, and the modeling. Um, so this is something where, at the moment, because you don't have a mechanism where the application logic can be codified, it really limits uh, the sorts of things uh, where you can deploy and, and how you can make sure that when you are running on a particular infrastructure that the application requirements are, are really addressed. Um, so I would say at the moment a lot of the, the, the infrastructure's code modeling focuses more on the mechanics of, of the underlying infrastructure and less about whether that particular combination is the only thing that can really satisfy the application uh, constraints or not. Um, so by combining these two into an abstract model, it gives us the ability to, to see, determine whether there are other resources that can be swapped in and out uh, to deal with uh, or to make sure that the application requirements are still met uh, while providing increased uh, efficiency and cost effectiveness for the workload. Morning, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Karim Jemama from the University of Leeds in the UK. Uh, my question is to do with the use of self-adaptation. What kind of methodology did you actually implement? Um, so we, we did this in two different ways. So within the vehicle IoT case, uh, we have uh, basically a, a MAPE-K model that we use internally uh, for driving the reconfiguration within the application logic. Um, so the application uh, that's deployed there, it has multiple things that it can do um, to reconfigure itself within the vehicle. So that may mean that um, because we are crossing a border, for example, uh, we suddenly need to turn on or off um, communications with certain backends, or we may need to turn off um, certain functionalities um, so, for example, driver monitoring, if we're looking at biometric data, 
And then we deal with a border crossing situation, then we either need to pivot uh, the point of processing of that data uh, or try to push it back down to the edge and, and deal with it in place to avoid uh, the case of, of uh, transferring biometric data across borders. Um, the other case is uh, within SODLAT itself, we have another um, adaptation uh, layer that looks more at the, uh, at the infrastructure level itself. Um, and this is, is a, a very similar, uh, very similar to the make model, where we are monitoring the runtime, and based off of this, uh, we make some some analysis, and then we make a, a plan for the redeployment, uh, which goes to the orchestrator, and this then uh, produces a, an optimized blueprint, uh, which is then executed. So these are the, uh, I would say, the key the key points. And Thank you. There's a knowledge base, of course, in, in the middle of that, which uh, keeps track of all of the deployment facts and and and, uh, and the environment. So, so. It's, it seems to me that it's very much also a, a monitor, uh, uh, analyze, plan, and execute. You you keep you have a sort of uh, continuous loop that looks at what is happening both at the infrastructure and the application. Exactly. So it's it's really you could think of it as a sort of a hierarchical set of of MAPE K loops. Thank you. Okay, more questions? I have another one, if you may. Yes, please. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm also interested in the in HPC from the from the infrastructure perspective, from the hardware perspective. So I could see that you are considering traditional CPUs and seemed like resources like GPUs. Mm -hmm. uh, have have you or will you be considering, for example, heterogeneity in terms of FPGAs as well, or is it something that you feel is outside the scope of HPC? It's really de de dependent on the use case requirements. So the two that we have right now that are leveraging the HPC resources are, are more traditional GPU problems. Um, so they tend to be using the GPU clusters that are available within the, the systems that we have. Um, within the edge case, we are using a variety of accelerators. Um, so we have uh, uh, basically um, the edge GPUs are one thing. We have embedded GPUs. Um, we also have, uh, we've also done some experimentation with FPGAs, uh, mostly for acceleration or hardware acceleration of uh, OpenCV using programmable logic. Um, but this is something that is more on the application side and that is not really um, dealt with within the uh, satellite framework directly. Uh, so it's a bit more agnostic of the underlying uh, accelerator types, and it's simply up to us from the use case point of view um, to define the different kinds of optimizations that can be applied and to generate the different container runtimes that can support these different accelerators. Thank you. Okay, so more questions? We still have time. May I okay. ask another one? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kari. <laughs> it's just very, very interesting that again, looking at what is happening in the in in, in the arena of, of of HPC, and I could see that uh, you are also uh, uh, having uh, Cray uh, as as uh, as as part of the um, the sort of consortium. Um, is there is there any say vision? Who in the next maybe two three years in what we call exascale HPC, because there is a lot of of course work at the moment to get ready for not HP well for for the next stage which is basically exascale HPC. I'm just again I'm just curious about uh, what are you the views of your partners on this. Um, unfortunately, I cannot speak for for Cray or Hewlett Packard Enterprise on on their exascale strategy. So this is something you would have to ask them directly. Um, it, it certainly has not been a factor within SOTLAT, um as we are not really looking at uh, system scalability on, on the HPC side as, as a focus. We're dealing more with how do we deal with the application codification and, and deployment and, and, uh, and the reconfiguration of this. So I think in the third year, uh, which will be next year, we're going to look a lot closer at um, basically the application performance monitoring and, and looking at, uh, at these sorts of aspects. Um, so we should have a, a much better idea 
of the kinds of improvements uh, that can be realized with this kind of an approach. Um, but certainly in the uh, water scarcity use case, for example, they're already seeing that uh, with this kind of approach applied that they can already improve uh, quite a lot of their performance. Now, will the scale to exascale? I have no idea. Um, once somebody builds an exascale system and gives us an account, I think uh, we'd be happy to try it out. Yeah, yeah this is, it's interesting because the because of the the use case always being driven by potentially more and more resources. Uh, you are making use, of course, of, of, of the existing HPC resources. Is that the, the 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 vision in the next few years is that you could see exascale as in itself as a service, and because of the nature of the disruptive applications that span from say an HPC data center to a cloud data center to an edge and finally to an IoT layer is extremely interesting, especially in terms of workflows and workflows management. So uh, again, maybe there will be a call on this in the next few years. <laughs> and uh, keep I'm an eye on it. There will be, yes. But I think one of the, um, one of the interesting aspects um, on the HPC side is, of course, it's a very valuable resource. Um, so you don't want to be tying it up unnecessarily if you don't have to. Um, this is quite important also in terms of, the, of, of cost and performance. So there are some workloads that will do really well um, using an HPC resource, uh, something that's embarrassingly parallel, for example, that could run quickly to completion um, and, and be much faster and more cost effective than doing the same thing in, in cloud. Uh, within our use case, uh, for example, we look at this in, in the context of machine learning models. Um, so in the vehicle IoT case, uh, for example, uh, we have a, a base model in TensorFlow that has to be trained. Uh, and at the moment, uh, to do this uh, in cloud takes uh, takes several days. Um, so if we can do the same thing on, on HPC within, within a matter of, of minutes, uh, then of course this is something that uh, becomes much more attractive uh, from an online training point of view. And that completely changes um, the kind of dynamic. So now instead of your model being something that's fixed that you'll uh, only update really infrequently, it's something that we can really look at um, whenever there's enough data available, uh, does it make sense to go and, and cut and release of, of the base model? Um, and then from that, this is something that can go into cloud uh, for, for basically continuous delivery down to the edge, uh, where we have to look at how do we develop uh, or new containers uh, that take this retrained model and then apply the, the transformation uh, that's needed to these models to apply them into the specific uh, container runtimes for those specific uh, accelerators. Uh, before that gets pushed down then uh, to the edge devices for for inference or whatever else. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Karim, for your questions. Okay, so if uh, there is no more questions, I think that we can we can close this webinar and. I would like to invite you for the next one. There is no information already uh, on the website, but it will be soon. So we will inform you uh, through our website and our social media channels. And hope to see you there next time. Thank you very much.